Okay, well, welcome to session six. We, we started strong this morning, so I trust that we will uh, finish strong. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our last invited speaker, Christy Lee, who comes to us from UNC Chapel Hill. Christy's a, a longtime friend of mine and a longtime friend of Surge. Um, her current titles at UNC are research associate professor as well as clinical assistant professor. And she has a, a longstanding interest in a variety of genomic applications that range from cancer to eye disease to many other things. So in line with lots of our other conversations um, during the meeting, she's going to talk more about exome sequencing and the challenges that lie within. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Great, great. Good morning. Um, I wanted to thank the meeting organizers for inviting me to come here today. And I'd also like to thank you guys for um, staying for the end. So um, without further ado, I'll get started. Wanted to talk to you today about some challenges that we've had interpreting exome variants um, and also explaining them to um, our, our participants. And most of this uh, data today is in the setting of NC genes study, which many of you have heard about through various talks, so I just want to give a brief background um, and then we'll move uh, forward with challenges. So the NC Gene study is an exome sequencing study um, at UNC that's currently enrolling um, children and adults with suspected genetic disorders. And this particular uh, study is part of the um, NHGRI um, Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Consortium. And that, the whole purpose of that group is not necessarily to study the, the yield of exome sequencing, it's to study the LC issues. Um, so this study um, has a very uh, large social science component, which will help us um, give you a little bit of information about the insights from patients and the patient perspective. So um, we've had 514 patients make it through the molecular analyst stage, and these are their presenting conditions. So the majority are um, either uh, children or adults with uh, thought to be syndromic or dysmorph um, dysmorphic features. Um, we've had um, a large uh, cohort of neurological disorders, which are children and adults and a large um, cohort of hereditary cancers. We have a smaller cohort of cardiovascular and um, retinal uh, dystrophies, and we're building a cohort of um, bleeding disorders. So our diagnostic approach um, is a little bit different. Um, when you use exome sequencing, you're going to get um, a large number of variants. We all know that. Um, we're ranging between 70 to over 120,000 uh, variants per participant. Um, and we use a filtration process too. Um, we are not using trios. Um, trios would be nice. This was more of a financial decision for us. We could actually do more exomes um, without doing trios. So we follow up with parental studies. Um, we use a phenotypic guide, guided gene list approach to um, sort our variants. Um, so these are gene lists that are made for particular phenotypes uh, like cardiovascular disease. We have um, arrhythmia, we have um, hearing loss, um, and it's not uncommon for participants to have multiple phenotypic, phenotypic uh, gene lists to, um, to use. And then the, the variants within those genes are designated known or likely pathogenic, um, variants of unknown significance are known or likely benign. And any results that we're going to return back to participants are uh, confirmed by Sanger sequencing in the hospital CLIA lab. So our yield is uh, a little similar to what's been reported with other studies. Um, unfortunately, about 60% are getting a negative result. Almost 30%, um, excuse me, almost 40% are getting um, either a possible or a positive uh, result. Um, so even though we're not using trios, we're, we're doing pretty well with our diagnostic yield. What is different for us um, is that we're probably having more possible results and not more positive results. Um, 
So if we break it down by condition, uh, this is how well we're doing. And it's very clear that some conditions do um, much better with exome sequencing than others. And it makes sense if you think about it. Our, our best performers are the cardi cardiovascular uh, group and the retinal group. Um, the reason for that being, um, particularly for retinopathies, we think the vast majority, um, if not all, have a uh, single gene genetic component. So um, that would explain a higher yield. The other that you see here, um, I, I didn't highlight because there's only about six of those, so the, the numbers are just small. Um, but that would be, um, for instance, non-syndromic hearing loss that, that would have been um, an other. Um, our worst performer is cancer. There's a couple reasons for that. One is, this is a, a selected um, group here because most of these folks have already had clinical testing that was not fruitful. So we've already looked at most of the big players here. The other um, possible reason is a lot of uh, cancer is not hereditary, or at least it's not single gene, and so those are going to be harder to, to pick out. Um, so let's start with or talk about some challenges with the variant interpretation. And we have a, um, a meeting once a week where we talk about variants, and it involves um, um, molecular geneticists, um, uh, medical geneticists, genetic counselors, trainees, um, where we get together. And it's probably everybody's favorite meeting every week, and it is mine. Um, and we, we're seeing some themes of some challenges when, when we're trying to interpret some of these variants. So I thought I would point out some of these themes to you so you can see on the lab side um, sort of what they're going through when they're analyzing um, data. So probably one of the biggest issues we have is, is getting a, a single variant within a gene that's typically um, inherited in a recessive fashion. Sometimes we struggle with whether a variant is diagnostic, so is it the whole story or is it just contributory, just part of the story. So since we are not doing trials, we're not filtering out um, variants that may have been passed down from a parent in the dominant conditions. And so we struggle sometimes with when we do parental studies and we find a parent does have um, the, the same variant as the child, when do we invoke um, uh, incomplete penetrance or variable expressivity? And when do we report a VUS? Uh, how about when it's atypical uh, for the disease mechanism that's been reported? And what if it requires a expansion of the phenotype? How far do we go there? And w should we be a little bit more lenient if we could maybe adjudicate the variant with additional testing, like biochemical testing? And then how do we uh, handle incidental variants? Should we handle them a little differently? We certainly agree that we should have a, a more uh, stringent threshold for reporting. Um, but we wonder sometimes with the same variant that we're looking at and struggling with and, and as an incidental finding would have been easily called in a patient with that disease. So just to give you some examples of each of, of these issues that we've been having, all of these uh, listed here, and this is a small subset, this is a problem we run into quite frequently. Um, all of these have either been reported or they're truncating mutations that would be likely to be pathogenic. And all of these fit the phenotype for these particular participants. Um, so we struggled with these. Um, all of these were in, ended up being reported to the participant. The thought being is that there could be a copy number variant on the other allele that we're not, we're not picking up. We actually, uh, we do have a brilliant research assistant, unfortunately he's going to medical school soon, um, who developed an algorithm where we are able to pick up some copy number variants. We think we do so with, with pretty good accuracy, but we, it's not clinical grade and we know we could be missing some, so all of these people are offered um, copy number variant analysis. And probably the biggest um, players are going to be um, the conditions that have a lot of heterogeneity. So retinitis pigmentosa, um, we're seeing that a lot. Um, speaking of which, we're also running into trouble when we have multiple single variants that are associated with the same disease. Now, how do we, how do we wrap our heads around this? So this first case is an 18-year-old male with retinitis pigmentosa. And he had three different variants. The two missense changes are, are reported pathogenic variants. Um, the um, OAT is a nonsense change. And so we were wondering, are, are they working together? Um, we did parental studies, and sure enough, dad has all three. So we've got to go back to the drawing board um, for, this, for this guy. Although we, we did offer um, 
copy number variant, and also sequencing for RPGR, which is a gene associated with X-linked retinitis pigmentosa that doesn't perform well in exome sequencing. So these two ladies are really interesting. Um, both have a clinical diagnosis of Stargardt's disease, and both came into the study knowing that they had one ABCA4 mutation. Um, ABCA4 is associated with a recessive form of Stargardt's disease. And what we found is that 30% of those individuals will only have one ABCA4 variant that's pathogenic. So we don't understand what's going on in the other allele. So we enrolled them in the study thinking maybe we would find a, uh, an answer. And maybe we have, maybe we haven't. Um, but for our 56-year-old female, um, she also has a um, frame shift change in um, CNGB3, which is also associated with recessive Stargardt's disease. So we're wondering, what are the odds that she's a carrier for two different forms of Stargardt's disease and they're not related to her Stargardt's disease? Um, the 35-year-old is, is very interesting as well. Now, she has no family history. These are both simplex cases. Um, but she also had uh, a known uh, reported pathogenic variant um, in um, the GUCA1A gene, which is associated with autosomal dominant um, cone rod dystrophy. Again, no family history. Um, so uh, we're wondering whether the ABCA4 is a modifier or she's just a carrier for another form of Stargardt's disease. Cone rod dystrophy is very similar and she's young, so it may be that her cones are only affected at this point and the rods could develop um, uh, disease later. So this could be just an early pickup. Um, we're not sure, so the jury's still out there. And then this last case is a five-year-old male who was referred for developmental delay di uh, dysmorphic features. And he has um, two um, interesting variants um, that are both asso associated with recessive disease. Um, and I point him out he, um, because we struggled with the fact that his features, he has numerous features, and his features really could be consistent with most of the genes on our diagnostic list. And so he was quite a struggle to try to pick out which variants might be important and, and worth um, reporting so that we could go back and do parental studies. Okay, so sometimes we struggle with, do we have, a, do we have an answer or, and do we need to keep looking? So this top case is pretty straightforward. This is an eight-year-old male um, referred for developmental delay, macrocephaly, and hearing loss. And what we found for him, um, we ran him on our, de our developmental delay list, but also our non-syndromic hearing loss, just in case they were indeed separate. And we found a frame shift mutation in a gene that's associated with non-syndromic hearing loss. So for him, we feel like we definitely have something that's contributed to the phenotype, but has not answered the whole question, so we need to keep going. This, this male, 55-year-old um, male, was also interesting. These variants were picked up as incidental findings here. These two, these two missense changes are known to um, ride together in cysts. Um, so this sh uh, is one allele and this frame shift is on the other allele. And of course, this gene is associated with biotinidase deficiency, a metabolic disorder that's recessive. Those individuals can have op optic atrophy. So we think this is um, maybe the explanation for this. But he also has a personal family history of neuropathy. And the, this recessive disease shouldn't explain that family history. So we think we need to keep going there, although there can be some um, neuropathy symptoms in, in biotinidase deficiency that's not treated. Um, the last one we are still fighting over. Um, th these are actually two females that had the same um, frame shift mutation in BARD1, which is associated with breast cancer. Both of these women have personal and family histories of breast cancer. and. Um, this is the 66-year-old diagnosed at 33 with a family history. Um, part of our group feels like we've got an answer here, and part of our group says this is probably contributory, but we need to keep going. Um, we know from Mary Claire King's work that um, it is not uncommon to have multiple um, moderate uh, risk alleles that, that involved uh, with cancer in their family history. So this is still a mystery. And this is the other lady at 58 with a diagnosis of breast cancer at 56 in her family history. So this is reported back to her as a, or to them as contributory and we'll keep looking. Um, but it's unclear whether this, this is the, the explanation. So what happens when you've got a variant, you think it's a good fit, you go check the parents, you're really, really hoping for de novo and it's not de novo. Um, when do we invoke um, um, 
the fact that it could be incomplete penetrance. So these are some things we consider. Um, how, how well does the phenotype fit? Is it an excellent fit or not? Um, has the variant been previously reported? That would help us feel more confident in that. Are there previous reports of incomplete penetrance within that gene and that condition? And is there known to be variable expressivity? Maybe there are just some mild symptoms we're not picking up on. Um, so we did have a couple examples here, this is one five-year-old male with a uh, history of developmental delay, macrocephaly, and hypotonia. And we found uh, a missense change in the 6-3 gene, which is associated with whole and prosencephaly type 2. Um, did parental studies, the mother has um, uh, the variant. I put unaffected in quotes because when they came back for return of results, our, our return of results involve a genetic counselor and a medical geneticist. The medical geneticist noticed that she looked to be a little hypertoloric which could be in the spectrum of whole and prosencephaly, so maybe indeed this is just um, variable expressivity. Um, this gene has been associated with incomplete penetrance, so it fit the phenotype well, so this was reported out as a possible result. So we struggle with one particular variant that's very common, and lots of other people struggle with it too. It's associated with um, um, the BBS1 gene, and it has been described in individuals with with Bardet Bidel, retinitis pigmentosa, or cone rod dystrophy, and absolutely no phenotype. Um, and this is well documented in the literature, so we're not the only ones struggling with this, but we have all three of those scenarios in, so it makes us uh, queasy every time it comes up. Um, it's thought that there are mo some modifier genes that are affecting the phenotype, and maybe we can help inform that. Uh, I don't know, a lot of people working on that. Um, the last case was a, a, a personal case of mine, um, very interesting, had a frame shift mutation. This is a novel variant. It's in a gene associated with um, autosomal dominant uh, fever type 4, which is a retinopathy. And this is his family tree here. Now, he was sent to me um, in, in our retina clinic for um, ocular albinism. He's um, very pale like me, um, has uh, bright blonde hair, blue eyes, and some of the features here certainly would go along with that particular clinical diagnosis. So he has nystagmus, strabismus that required surgery, hyperopia, light hypersensitivity, and what they described to be a blonde fundus on the retina exam. So we felt like, um, looking at some of the other um, descriptions of his retina, that this probably was a good fit for him. And then I went back, um, I was the molecular analyst on this case, I went back and looked at the pedigree that I drew and noted that I, I noted that his father and his brother had strabismus as well. So now we're wondering whether dad and brother actually have this variant as well and we're just seeing variable expressivity in his family. Um, and that would be s uh, somewhat unfortunate um, given he's got a four-year-old and we'll have to see. Um, fortunately, the four-year-old hasn't experienced any of this, which he had already had by this point, so maybe he is unaffected. So when to report out uh, variants of unknown significance. Um, one of the problems we've run into is finding what looks like should be a pathogenic mutation. This is a truncating mutation in CAV3, um, and this gene is associated with a limb girdle muscular dystrophy phenotype. That fits the phenotype for this particular um, participant, but it doesn't fit the mutation type for this particular gene. There have been uh, no known that we can find described truncating mutations in CAV3. They're all missense changes or in-frame deletions or duplications. So we're kind of scratching our heads as to whether this is the fit or not. So this is reported back as a possible finding until um, we can um, gather more data or see some reports of this. And in the meantime, we'll continue to look for another potential answer. We also sometimes have to invoke an expansion of phenotype. Um, this particular case was a 30-year-old male with simplex, so no family history, non-syndromic macular dystrophy, which is similar to um, a BEST disease, which is an autosomal dominant macular dystrophy. And what we found was a missense change in the um, PITPNM3 gene, which has been associated with autosomal dominant um, Conrad dystrophy. Again, he does not have a family history. When looking through the literature, this particular variant in this gene has been reported in two different Swedish families. Um, one of the Swedish families is a five generation, numerous individuals affected. Um, the other family is a seven generation, numerous affected. They don't think the families are related, but th they haven't proven it. They probably are if you go far enough back. Um, but this family has cone dystrophy. And, um, I looked back at the both of these papers um, that report these two families, 
And there's no incomplete penetrance in seven or five generations, which was interesting to me. However, if you look in the EXEC browser, which is where we're um, looking for allele frequencies in different populations, you'll find that 175 individuals also have this variant. Um, and so that seems to be high for the, the frequency or incidence of this particular condition. Um, Polyfin and SIF both predict this is benign. We don't heavily depend on in silico models, but we let them sort of uh, if we're already leaning one way, we'll help, it'll help us lean a little harder one way or the other. Um, so this was not reported back to the participant. We feel like we need to keep looking in, in this case. Interestingly enough, both of these families, they did linkage analysis. They both linked to 17P, which is where this gene is located. But there are several other retinal genes located in this area as well. So I'm wondering if whether this is in dis uh, linkage disincolorium with the, uh, another mutation that's actually the cause of cone dystrophy in these families. So this is um, um, a case um, that we did report. Um, this is a 58-year-old female. She's down in the corner down here with a pheochromocytoma. And in her, we found a um, novel, um, apparently novel, we can't find any um, reports of this particular variant in the CDKN1B gene. And the amino acid is well conserved. Uh, the gene is associated with uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 4, so it's a very rare type of MEN. Um, with that, you see um, pituitary adenomas, agromegaly, and renal angiomyolipoma. But there's no previous reports of pheochromocytomas. So we thought, well, pheos are certainly involved with other types of MEN. Could it be that there just aren't a lot of reports of MEN type 4? Um, we don't know it to be associated with pheo, so we're not looking for it in folks with pheochromocytomas. Could this be an expansion of the phenotype? And um, the family history would fit dominant fashion, potentially. Um, the paternal grandmother was thought maybe to have a pheochromocytoma. But then I looked back um, when I was putting this talk together, and her father had kidney disease. Maybe it could be the renal angiomyolipoma. I don't know. I, I always joke around, I can write a good story about almost any variant, so we have to be careful with that. But this was reported back as a um, possible uh, result. And we'll keep looking, but we, we're, we're really excited about this one for this family. So um, we're a little bit maybe more lenient or getting to be more lenient about reporting of a variant where we can adjudicate it with additional testing. And we do the additional testing through the study, so we're not asking the patient to, or participant to bear the cost. Um, but I fought hard for this one. We found two um, variants in um, the factor eight gene, which is again the only gene associated with hemophilia A. Um, it's really easy to rule out hemophilia A in a male. You do a factor eight level. If it's normal, you're done. Um, so uh, when this first came up, I argued um, uh, and, and fought to get us to report this, because these were picked up as incidental findings, and we're not reporting out um, variants of unknown significance in incidental findings. Um, I said, well, we could get a factor level, and the kid will know that day whether um, the, the, the child's affected or not. So I won the argument, and I, I lost the first battle. The uh, child had normal factor eight levels, so um, I caught a lot of flack for that. But um, that's okay, because the next one was affected, um, and I argued for this one too. I'm a, I'm a hemophilia counselor, so um, I had to, to argue for hemophilia, and it would be not unlikely for a four-year-old and nine-year-old male to go undiagnosed with mild hemophilia, both these variants had been seen previously in, or reported previously in kids with mild hemophilia. So um, I felt um, very satisfied when we did catch one, and, and ironically, I'm seeing him on Monday in clinic, in our hemophilia clinic. Um, this got reported back to the family, and the family says, oh yeah, we have a family history of hemophilia. <laughs> okay, well good, rock on. So. Incidental findings, of course, these are results that we never want to see, but they're important to share back, we think. Um, they're unrelated to why the participant was tested. Um, so we assume these are in asymptomatic individuals that are medically actionable. So there's something either we can prevent it or we can uh, have a treatment for it. Um, so that's why we're giving them back. Um, we feel like, and, and, and the field does as well, that we need to have a, a high bar for reporting these back. We don't want to report variants of unknown significance out because um, there's a low a priori risk that that variant would be abnormal anyway since it's in an unaffected individual. Um, so 
this is, um, this is a cohort, a retinal cohort that we did before we had the cohort in NC genes. Um, and I'm showing you this because this was out of 26 participants. Nine of them, so a third of them, had variants in genes associated with medically actionable diseases. All of these genes are in the um, um, ACMG 56 gene list. All of them had been reported as pathogenic before, and we reported none of them back. Um, some of them I still worry about. Um, some of them I don't. This particular variant was seen in two of our participants of 26. Um, I left out one individual who, we, he actually did have two um, truncating variants, one in BRCA2, one in MSH6 associated with Lynch syndrome. He's been reported by me and others, so I left him out of this talk. Um, but just out of 26 patients, we had nine where we had to go through several of these variants that were previously reported as pathogenic and try to go back and, and look with a the, with the different eye. And, and most of the time, we could say the, the allele frequency is just too high now that we have all, all this new data. Um, but this is a struggle, and we don't want to miss any of these, but yet it's, uh, we don't want to report and, and cause worry and undue testing um, by um, giving these out to folks when we're not sure. So let's get into explaining um, the variants with participants. Um, so when we talk to participants about enrolling in the study, we tell them there, there's one of three possible results. We're going to get a negative, we're going to get a positive, or we're going to get something that we're going to have trouble explaining to you. Um, so why do we get the negative results? And we go through um, a, um, a, a lot of information with participants about why we might have missed. Um, so technical difficulties are Always a possibility, did they have a trinucleotide repeat disorder? Um, did they have a copy number variant that we missed? Um, is it intronic and, and too deep we didn't see it? Did we filter it out? So we are using the phenotype uh, gene list. If our gene lists aren't good, we're not going to pick it up. Um, we do go back and do research sweeps afterwards, um, but the initial visit with results with the, with the parents is just our list. Um, did we see it? Was it right there in front of our faces? And maybe it was too common. Maybe we didn't understand it enough. We just decided not to report it back because we didn't think it was the answer. Um, and is it just not genetic? And some of the cancer patients, we have gone back and said, you know what? We think this is kind of reassuring. What you have just may not be single gene. Um, so what does a VUS mean? Um, it, a possible answer, it's not the answer. There's different grades of VUS. Um, some variants we are pretty confident about, but the data is just not there to support our theory. Um, sometimes the VUS is a long shot, and the only reason we're reporting it back is because it's truncating, we felt compelled to because it was on our list, and we want, say, their neurologist to comment. Um, could this possibly be an answer? We just don't want to miss something. Sometimes it's just clearly uncertain, so we go through that with, with families as well. Um, and, and we absolutely acknowledge that sometimes we're, we're giving them results back that could be red herrings. Um, the unexpected result is always challenging. The incidental findings is the definition of that. Um, but we also have cases where the inheritance pattern has changed. And this is mostly where we have a simplex case. We're thinking it's recessive. We find that, indeed, they have a dominant condition that is de novo. Um, that can be very um, reassuring and good news for a younger family where, where they, maybe they want more children, the recurrence risk will be lower for them to have another child with this condition. However, it can be quite devastating for our adult uh, patients who have de novo mutations because they're thinking that their children have probably had a low risk because it was recessive, and now we're telling them there's a 50-50 risk. So we've had that, those conversations as well, as well that, which have been really, really tough. Oh, and we've had a few, excuse me, that have changed the, the diagnosis. Um, and sometimes that's difficult for families because they've already latched on to a community or just an identity of having a particular diagnosis, but yet the molecular diagnosis is a bit different. So um, I mentioned that a big part of the NC Genes project is, is social science, which has been really fun and interesting. And there's different projects within, within the social science group. One of them was this project where they looked at 20 adults and 10 parents um, who were going to get back a possible result, okay? And what happened was um, we had a medical anthropologist who sat in the visit with us and the, the visit was taped. And then later, the, the parent or participant was interviewed by the, the anthropologist later to get um, some follow-up thoughts, probably about two weeks after the results were given. Um, 
and I'm going to show you some clips um, or snippets from the conversations that uh, went on. This was a scenario where the path it was a likely pathogenic variant because it was truncating, but it wasn't a great fit for the phenotype, and it was given back again for the referring clinician to sort of weigh in and see is it possible that this could be a, an answer. Um, but she was told that this was probably an unlikely cause. So the clinician is saying, um, I want to emphasize very strongly to you that I, uh, the genetic counselor, and the rest of the team don't feel like this is what's responsible for your neuropathy. Um, she has a um, uh, phenotype that um, doesn't look like uh, it's more of a neuropathy instead of an SCA, which is what the, the gene is associated with that we found a variant in. So the, the counselor says, I think this is a red herring, um, and basically we, um, we didn't find a genetic change that's caused your neuropathy. So in the, inter uh, the interviewer calls back, um, this is again about two weeks later, so what are you thinking about the cause of neuropathy? And the participant says, big question mark, unknown, remains unknown. Um, it means the science is still vague, um, and um, there aren't specific pinpoints of analysis that will tell indeed what's wrong with an individual as it relates to genetic anyway. So she kind of got the point, you know, we wanted her, this is uncertain, and then she certainly came away thinking, okay, this is uncertain. So sometimes it works, it's not always hard. Um, so sometimes it, uh, it doesn't work as well. So this is a case where we had a VUS, it was presented to the patient as a cer uh, clearly uncertain VUS, and um, she has a, um, she's had seizure-like episodes, and um, her variant has been associated with um, episodic ataxia. So she says this is a life-changing result, and even if there's no treatment, she's a, this is extremely significant to her because it's, it's redemptive. She's had a lot of good doctors, but she's had a, a, a horrible treatment by other doctors, and wow, this is what I have, and it's just good to put a name on something. What a relief. Uh, for her, but not for us. And so sometimes, you, to your best of your ability, you don't sort of hit the mark um, with her that this was clearly uncertain for us. Um, so again, sometimes what we tell people can confuse the, the situation or confuse a diagnosis. So this is the case I presented earlier with the, the woman with Stargardt's disease with one ABCA4 change and one change associated with dominant cone rod dystrophy. And um, she was actually upset um, to learn of this information because it, it, confused it confused her and she didn't know what it meant for her prognosis. So she says, I'm not even sure if I have Stargardt's anymore or if it's just mimicking with that dominant gene. Um, so I know that it, um, other genes can cause cone rod dystrophy. Um, I'm a bit confused because they didn't find the Stargardt's. Does that mean I even have Stargardt's if that's the case? Um, then what is it? Um, I'm unsure what this means for me as far as my diagnosis and what happens in the future. And quite frankly, she's confused because we're confused. We, we don't know how to interpret the data either, which is unfortunate. But she did get it because she, she understands about mimicking with the dominant gene. We were trying to talk about um, modifier genes and is, is ABCA4 being modified or modifying this other gene? Uh, so. Um, even when you know you're getting through to the patient, it's still confusing because the science is confusing, and, and um, this was upsetting for her, and that's too bad. Um, we've also had some disappointing close calls. This is an individual who's had a lifelong muscular dystrophy and axonal neuropathy. We found a, 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 a variant in KIF. Um, 1B, which has several different phenotypes associated, but one is thought to be Charcot-Marie Tooth, type 2B, I believe. And um, they were really hoping that this variant was de novo. Um, we did parental studies, unfortunately, as unaffected father um, also has the variant, which means that this is likely not the answer. Um, we're not going to invoke incomplete penetrance in this case. Um, and so he was very upset um, to learn about his result. They had all hoped they were getting closer to an answer, and we kind of dashed their hopes by giving this potential answer and then sort of taking it away. So that's really hard for us, too. Um, but now he hopes that future analysis will, um, future reanalysis by us will help pick up uh, a diagnosis later on and a genetic explanation for him. So overall findings from our social science team, um, participants really have no regrets for participating regardless of what results we give back to them, um, whether we confuse them or not. Um, but folks with uncertain results have a little bit more mixed feelings, which is certainly understandable. Um, patients want diagnostic results, even if there's no treatment. That's probably no surprise to anyone in this room. Um, 
they also study us, the social scientists do, um, and they assessed from us that we worry about reporting VUSs, and that is absolutely true from my perspective. Um, we, we don't want to give people false hope. We also don't want to get people not to keep looking, and we tell people this is not the last genetic test you will necessarily need. Um, and we actually um, fear sometimes putting it in the medical record because we don't want other clinicians to get complacent with what we found. Um, and we worry that other family members will get tested, maybe be negative, and feel reassured that they don't have whatever diseases in the family. Um, so these are definitely things that we certainly worry about. Um, what they taught us, the social science folks and our participants, um, was that for the most of the most of these folks, they live in uncertainty. They have uh, been through a diagnostic odyssey. They've had multiple tests that haven't given an answer. Um, and we're really uncomfortable with uncertainty, but for some of them, that's the world they live in. And to give them more information to say, hey, we still don't know, is actually what some of them expect. So it's, it's actually not as bad for them as we probably feel like it is, um, for some of them at least. So that was good to know in here. Um, Participants seem to have a relatively positive experience. They have reasonable expectations for the diagnostic yield, which is really nice and goes to the fact that the genetic counselors beat it into them that this test may not provide an answer so that we try not to disappoint folks when we, we do strike out. And it turns out that patients and, and parents are actually trying to find that fit too. They're also trying to, to write a story for that variant to make it fit. So when we give them back that VUS, they're going back to the literature, they're, they're searching on their own, trying to see how well this fits with their diagnosis. So that was interesting too. Um, and then uh, most of them expressed this promise and potential for future studies, um, data reanalysis, and, and hope that eventually we'll, we'll find something that will help them or other folks. Um, very altruistic group that's in our group and, and in most of these studies. So just some closing thoughts. Um, there are some challenges to interpreting and explaining results. These aren't new. Nothing I've explained here today is new. You've all experienced that with, with traditional genetic testing, but it is amplified because we're seeing it a lot. And um, we need to consider the potential benefits and the potential harms of reporting um, variants um, and, and try to strike that balance, which is really hard. We don't want to withdraw something or withhold something that could be an answer for families, and we don't want to cause undue worry or testing either. We need to properly prepare um, folks for results. That's telling them what type of results. Um, but also, I got, now I actually warn um, my patients who I've seen in the past, and I, and I meet them again, and I see a little bit of a decline. I warn them that we may not find something that has a very good prognosis. Um, so preparing patients properly really helps out on the back end when you're explaining results. Despite its challenges, it's an excellent diagnostic tool. You've seen that all morning. Um, and um, we, um, patients seem to have a reasonable understanding of their results, so that's reassuring as well. And with continued um, research, the diagnostic yield and, and their experience uh, should only improve. So with that, I will acknowledge our team at, um, at UNC. This is a, a picture of, of probably maybe half of the team that actually works on this is a, a large project for us and our, and our funding sources here. And uh, these are some of the names of, of our different projects. Uh, these are the clinicians that are enrolling participants um, and referring participants. Uh, these are clinicians that work a lot uh, as medical molecular analysts, and this is our social science team. Um, I'd like to thank Jonathan Berg, who's been an amazing mentor for me in um, helping me um, learn and, and grow as a molecular analyst, which has been really, really fun and, and enriching. Um, I'd like to thank Tasha Strandy for helping me develop some of these cases um, for you all today, and Kate Foreman, my colleague, who also helped uh, 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 donate some of these cases, and, and Deborah Skinner, who is uh, one of the members of the social science team that helped with some of the quotes. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Okay. Chris, are you, are you going back? Um, you continue to go back and reanalyze? Yeah, in fact, we're going to, we're probably going to, so the question was, are we going to go back and reanalyze? And the answer is yes. Um, 
we are probably going to stop enrollment um, towards the end of this year, and we have one more year of the grant. We're going to focus on finishing up the cases that have been enrolled and also going back and reanalyzing. Um, we're going to reanalyze um, all of the cases, and the gene list have been revised as well. So we'll run the analysis again and hopefully even look at new variants that we didn't look at last time. Um, and aside from that, we have um, some research associates um, who their job is to take a uh, subset of patients and go back and mine the data for potential novel genes. Um, so we'll probably be having fun with this data for years to come. Christy, this is an excellent talk. I have Thank one you. question and one comment. Um, the question I have is when you pick up um, cases like biotinidase deficiency, CPT2, do you confirm with biochemical testing further to see with enzyme testing what level it is? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, uh -huh, sorry. Go ahead. So, so if, if it's something that we can, uh, biochemically that we can test, we do that. We do that as part of the study. As a part and, of and that participant was um, deficient. Yeah. And can you comment on the time uh, for consenting and all it takes for a genetic counseling time it yeah, takes yeah. before and after? Sure. Um, thank you for your question. So um, this is going to vary a little bit. And we have a little bit of a, uh, of a biased population because a lot of these folks have seen genetics before. And so you don't really have to start at genes. You can start at testing um, and how this test is different. Um, but generally, I'm spending about 40, 45 minutes at least um, enrolling patients and, and participants into the study um, and, and going over. Uh, some of that is going through just the, the study information, but um, a lot of that is, is education. And then for results, um, it's generally about an hour as well. And, and it's long even for the negatives too because we try to go through why, why we've missed. Um, so about an hour, about 45 minutes to enroll and about um, um, if, it's, if it's something like cancer where we think maybe w there's not a genetic etiology after all, we, we maybe can do it in half an hour, but generally they're running at least 40 minutes, if not an hour. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Christy.